And so there's different types of opportunity. I mean, there's the opportunity where, you know, someone goes out and sells Purell for $10 a bottle. That, that I think is not the right kind of opportunity. But there are opportunities where we understand the business models are changing and how do we be relevant there. And thanks so much, uh, Ron, and for having me. And once again, glad to be part of this community and stay connected to everybody. Um, and as Ron said, I, I, I wanted to uh, share a few uh, thoughts around innovation. Um, this is a moment of, um, it's a moment of crisis, but there, and I wanted to share some thoughts on that first and why this is the right time to think about innovation as well. So I spent, uh, right after college, I spent um, a year in China and I've been in touch, continue to stay in touch with my students. And so I, I was just doing uh, trading emails with one a few weeks ago. And I wanted to make sure I remembered it correctly, but um, it's the case. The Chinese character for crisis, it's, it's Wei Ji, and Wei means danger, and Ji means opportunity. And those two elements form the word for crisis. And uh, you think about it, obviously we are, there is real danger to this crisis. There's a health risk, there's an economic risk, there's you know, business viability risk, but there is also opportunity. And so there's different types of opportunity. I mean, there's the opportunity where, you know, someone goes out and sells Purell for $10 a bottle. That, that I think is not the right kind of opportunity uh, to be pursuing. But there are opportunities where we understand the business models are changing and how do we be relevant there. And uh, also to think about what the world looks like after this. And, and I think there are um, things, some things, at least I, I, I hope and believe things will be a little different. So one of them is, facts. I think, you know, there has been quite a bit of confusion, uh, especially when the beginning of this crisis started. And rather than there be a reliance on speculation, I think facts and expertise will, will matter even more than they have in the past. I think another uh, uh, implication of where we are right now is the sense of connectedness, that, that one thing that can happen on the other side of the world has the potential to impact us. And so having a, a better sense and appreciation that our actions matter. Wherever they are, they matter, and they can have global implications. I think another thing that uh, I hope and believe will happen as a result of this is a respect, uh, a humble respect for nature, the understanding that we aren't in control. No matter how much we may think we're in control of everything, we're not. And uh, nature and science um, are, <laughs> are going to do what they do, and we have to have a, a measure of humility and, and respect for that. Uh, as I mentioned, opportunities will be out there. And we have to think about how our industry is transformed. Whatever it is, they're not going back to the new normal. And I'm most mindful, um, and I'll talk a bit about restaurants, because whatever, or even real estate for that matter, you know, the, a lot of those ex pre-existing models will not be the same once we get back to business. Um, so as I said, I want to talk today about um, innovation. And so I'm going to share with you a framework. This is something that I've brought to all of the different business opportunities. And I'm going to try to go relatively quickly because I want to, I guess, mostly throw out a bunch of ideas and, and let them sort of try to spur some thinking. And then hopefully we'll have time at the end for comments and questions. Uh, but I want to share with you a, a framework. And I'm going to talk about 10 different ideas that I've been part of. Not all of them I've been the, the CEO, but a lot of them I've been the, a dr key driver in. And um, this is how I'll present it. I'll first talk about an insight about what's wrong with a category, something that's missing. I'll share a, a macro trend that helps create a tailwind, special forces. And then the key for all of these innovations is there has to be some element that is, or a twist, some different take on it that allows the concept to break through. Because there's all lots of ideas out there, but it's only when there's an extra element, something special, that allows the idea to come to fruition and thrive in the marketplace. And so, I'll now um, take you through 10 of the, the innovations. The one that um, I've certainly uh, been, you know, I guess best known for is uh, an insight around the bottled beverage market. So um, going back to 1998, the mar market was oversweetened. You know, there was all bottled teas were super sweet. There was concerns that people had about what they were putting in their body. And we also learned that people don't trust beverage companies to tell the truth. There was just so much hype. And so that led to honesty. Uh, and so as a result, you know, we said, okay, well, let's bring a product out that addresses health and wellness by being lower calorie. Let's address concerns people have about what they're putting in their body by, you know, think about environmental consciousness, in this case, organic. 
And then let's really do honest, authentic marketing. Let's not make any claims that we can't back up. Let's emphasize connecting with people through sampling and, and being active on the streets and in, in the stores where people can see us. And that led to Honest Tea, a, a brand I started out of my house now 22 years ago with five thermoses and an empty Snapple bottle, which uh, I still have, and uh, managed to, to get into Whole Foods and grow from there. And so uh, one of the things, one of the most successful aspects of Honest Tea uh, is our second innovation, which was, uh, you know, I have, as I mentioned, three sons. And uh, when our sons were in middle school, I was always making the lunches for them to, to take to, to school. And one day my, my middle son said, Dad, how come um, you're selling these healthy drinks to grownups, but the drink pouches you're putting in my lunchbox are really sweet. And I looked at the calorie profile of the drink pouches. I was buying the Capri Sun, you know, blue pouches. And I, I realized 100 calories per pouch meant there was more sugar per ounce in those pouches than there was in a can of soda. And then I looked at the ingredients, the main ingredients, high fructose corn syrup, uh, and I realized, boy, here I am, this you know, health, health conscious uh, father buying these, these products for my son, and if that's what I'm doing, a lot of them, and I looked at the market further and I realized people are just buying on price. All of these drink pouches, $2 for 10 pouches, it's basically, whatever's on sale is, is what they're buying. And you say, well, what if we, instead of having it be, 100 calories made it 40, 40 calories per pouch. And instead of uh, high fructose corn syrup, we put only organic ingredients in. And instead of trying to play on price, we just played on higher quality. And in fact, we charged more than twice the price. We um, put eight pouches in it for $4, uh, $3.99. And the product we brought to market was Honest Kids, which today is now uh, sold in um, over 100,000 outlets in, in McDonald's, Wendy's, Chick fil A, Subway as well as uh, retail locations, and in fact is larger than Honest Tea in terms of its sales volume. So um, a fun uh, innovation we were able to bring to life. And as I started to gain that insight into what was happening in the kids market, uh, a woman approached me who had, um, she had gone to a, a talk there where John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods was speaking, and she says, I've got an idea for organic baby food. And, uh, through a series of introductions, uh, she was put in touch with me by the folks at Whole Foods. And she says, I've got an idea for baby food um, and I'd love to get your guidance on it. And I became the, the, the first board member of this company. And the insight was um, parents are, so what I learned from Honest Kids is parents will spend more on their kids if it's a high quality product. Um, there was a perception that baby foods aren't fresh. They, they are, um, you know, you see those dark colors in the glass jars. And uh, those products, you know, parents want to buy fresher. Parents also had concerns about sourcing. They didn't know where the product was coming from. And then the glass jars just weren't convenient. So um, she said, well, what if we find a way to make baby food that's non-pasteurized, that has fresh colors, it could make it organic so that they know the sourcing is clean. And the first solution was to make it in a frozen. So this company is called Happy Baby. And we launched frozen uh, baby food. And you can see it's, they're almost like uh, ice cubes uh, sold in the frozen case and very bright colors. Because, of course, freezing is non-pasteurized. You, when you cook the food, uh, you freeze it and it's safe because it's been frozen, but there's no um, pasteurization. So that on its own wasn't enough. It was when we converted the product to pouches that the whole market transformed. And so Happy Baby was the first our organic baby food company to uh, sell product in pouches. And, and um, as you, if you look now at a, at a baby food shelf, you'll see over 80% of that shelf is now sold in pouches. So um, the interesting aspect of this innovation, okay, organic was interesting, uh, non-pasteurized was interesting, but it was the packaging that actually transformed the opportunity. The next innovation uh, was as I started growing on this tea, I was thinking about the fact that we were living in this very um, sort of eco-conscious community, but we were seeing growth happen in such a fast way, there wasn't really a strategy to it. And so um, uh, I recognize people would want to leave greener, more environmentally friendly lives, they just needed more guidance. I also noticed there was just no support for entrepreneurs. I had, um, when I launched on this tea, the only um, aspect of Bethesda that, you know, sort of, I. Uh, 
was able to utilize was a, the post office box. Otherwise, there was no support. <laughs> My first office you know, location was the, the PO box down on Wisconsin Avenue. Uh, and so I thought, well, what if we tried to connect and guide this community around environmental consciousness? Uh, we could, as a start, install recycling bins and find other ways to, to inspire and um, create daily green living. And we also set up a green business incubator. Uh, and that, was, uh, that has become Bethesda Green, which is now, um, you know, has a full uh, running green business incubator and continues to provide guidance for both businesses and citizens to lead more green lives. And of course, you, we're all familiar with how Bethesda has accelerated its growth, but I'd like to think is doing so in, a, in an uh, environmentally conscious way. The next innovation is about um, thinking about a better acquisition model. So Honest Tea was growing. We became the best-selling tea in the natural foods industry. We were um, getting lots of inquiries from national chains that wanted us. And we realized that distribution was going to be our, our barrier to growth. And so we needed to become part of a larger distribution system. And we were approached by lots of different companies, including Nestle and, and Danone. Uh, and we ended up partnering with Coca-Cola. But as we started to talk with them, I said, you know, we can't just have this be a, a case where Coca-Cola buys the business because we've seen so many mergers that kill and dilute brands, especially entrepreneurial brands. The entrepreneur leaves disappointed and, and sales decrease and it doesn't make sense for the acquirer and it doesn't make sense for the entrepreneur. So I said, well, what if we could find a way to keep the founder in charge? If we could, instead of making this a full acquisition, make it a staged acquisition. So first, uh, Coca-Cola buys 43% of Honest Tea and then later buys 95% of Honest Tea. But we keep the brand based in Bethesda. And so that's what we did together with Honest Tea and Coca-Cola. And uh, they made their first investment in 2008. We, they bought the brand in 2011. And just uh, at the end of last year, um, Coca-Cola uh, moved the brand back to uh, Atlanta after I announced I was going to be uh, launching some new ventures. Uh, but one of the exciting aspects is that the brand grew more than 11 fold uh, after from Coke's first investment. And so for other way to make an acquisition happen. Innovation number six was uh, in recognition that business books are boring. I um, wanted to tell the story of Honest Tea, but I wanted to do it in a way that was more engaging and brought in a wider audience. I had, um, so I started to read different business books and I found them both text heavy and ego heavy, meaning it was just kind of a, it was work to, 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 to get through. And I also saw these books were read only by business people and I wanted to encourage a wider audience to engage in business. Uh, and I also rec I read that business books are the most unfinished books. Lots of them get started, but not many of them get finished. And so what was interesting was at this time, this was 2013, my, uh, or 2011, when I, the book was published in 2013, but in 2011, as I was thinking about this, my oldest son was in high school and he was um, in his senior, he was entering the senior slump, by which I mean, he had finished his, he'd gotten into college. And instead of doing his homework, he kept reading all these comic books and I was supposed to be keeping him on task. But instead he'd say, well, look at this comic book. It's so interesting. And it made me realize if I could uh, combine a business book and a comic book, that would be a, a fun way to, to share um, part of our story. And so um, we made a comic book uh, telling the story of honesty uh, called Mission in a Bottle. And it actually became a New York Times bestseller uh, and a much more engaging way to um, share the business and brought, bringing in a much wider audience as well. So um, after we had sold Honest Tea to Coca-Cola, I still remained involved in the business, but I kept thinking, what's the next entrepreneurial challenge I can get involved with? And um, this one, I didn't necessarily seek out. This was actually my wife read an article about this company getting started on the West Coast called Beyond Meat. And our family has been vegetarian uh, now for about 14 years. Um, and we were always happy with the decision from an ethical perspective but often disappointed with the decision from a culinary perspective. Um, and by that, I mean that we just, veggie burgers taste terrible. Um, and uh, it's a limited audience. They're not made for mainstream consumption. In fact, I've joked before that veggie burgers were a conspiracy by the meat industry to discourage people from becoming vegetarian because they would taste them and then just say, I, I don't need to be a vegetarian that badly. And there hadn't been any innovation in this category. They were basically 
a bunch of companies that would take uh, in, uh, plants and mush them together and say, this is supposed to be a substitute from the meat of a cow. And so what was wonderful about, uh, I reached out to the folks at Beyond Meat. I actually just sent an email to info at beyondmeat.com. And I realized what they were doing that was so profoundly different is that rather than just trying to replicate the look of a burger, they were defining and recognizing that we could look at meat two different ways. You can say, well, what is meat? And you might just say meat is animal that comes from a protein. But instead of defining meat, I'm sorry, that comes from a protein that comes from an animal. But instead of defining meat by its origin, what if you define it by its composition? And what I mean by that is to say, well, meat is really an assemble of amino acids that form the proteins, lipids that form the fats, 70% water, and then some trace minerals and carbohydrates. Well, if that's your definition of meat, then it's just a scientific equation to replicate it. And if you work at it with enough science and enough rigor, you can replicate the taste and texture of meat. And then, so you, we developed a product that was really a breakthrough product. And then when we understood that only vegetarians were buying um, veggie burgers, we said, well, let's merchandise these products in the meat section. And of course, in order to gain that access, we had to have a product that was good enough where a buyer would accept it there. And then let's go after every category of meat. Let's build a whole suite of products. And that's what became, has become Beyond Meat. And, and as you know now, is carried in... Uh, really almost every grocery store in the country and numerous fast food chains as well. So then as, as uh, we talked about, it led me to think about a different restaurant model. Uh, and what it, so what we saw is people are buying plant protein in restaurants. There's, there's interest in it, but there's no pure play. There's, you know, you could get a, and it's wonderful. You can go to Dunkin' Donuts and get the Beyond Breakfast Sausage Patty. You can go to Carl's Jr. and get the that Carl's uh, famous star beyond star burger. And so um, there are options available, but there's no one selling only plant-based products. And then um, we recognize most vegan foods uh, aren't delicious enough. Most vegan restaurants just don't focus on the taste and quality of the food. They're, they're more mission driven. And then as I looked at the restaurant model, I realized, boy, that's a tough business model. <laughs> I, um, I, uh, I thought we have to find a different way to, 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 to commercialize and launch a restaurant. So I said, okay, let's start a restaurant that is entirely plant-based, but instead of just saying we're, we're you know, saving the earth, let's find a, a partner, in this case, um, top, uh, Spike Mendelson, who's a DC-based chef. He, had won, he was the, won the first season of Top Chef, and I had been on a panel with him and uh, shared some burgers, which he thought were delicious, and said, let's launch a restaurant. And, and we actually had lunch in Bethesda. We walked around downtown Bethesda, and as I walked around, I saw, you know, all these for lease signs up of these restaurants. So on the one hand, like, well, there's space available, but it also made me think, boy, you know, this restaurant idea of, of paying a, a fixed lease for a restaurant, whether it does well or not, is a tough business model. And so I said, Spike, I love the idea, but rather than us go and set up our own uh, building and do the build out, um, what if we approach Whole Foods and we say, let us locate this restaurant inside of Whole Foods. And so then Whole Foods shares in both the, you know, the lease burden as well as the build out. And we already have a pre-selected audience because we know that Whole Foods is the top uh, retailer for uh, Beyond Meat and those types of products. And so um, that's the model we set up that, that you saw run at Silver Spring. And uh, the Silver Spring store has been successful enough that we just launched a new store in DC and South Capitol, uh, uh, their store there. And um, it is one of the few new restaurants that has emerged. Uh, and we call the restaurant Plant Burger. And you can look at that logo and you'll see the word, you could see the word plant or planet or plenty. And you look at the logo, you might see a planet, you might see a burger, uh, or you might see both. And it's been really fun to see that restaurant come to life. One of the really neat, um, elements of the, the restaurant is that both my wife and son um, were actually involved in the business before I could. I, because of my relationship with Coca-Cola and Beyond Meat, I was not able to be an active partner. And so they led the charge for this. But as I saw them um, having so much fun and, and seeing such, so many great results, I uh, wanted to get involved. And my son, um, who's heading up the marketing, came up with this great phrase, which is a, it's a play on the phrase that is attributed to Gandhi be the change you wish to see in the world. And he created this phrase, eat the change you wish to see in the world. 
I thought, wow, eat the change. That's a powerful idea. And it led me, led me to a next insight, which is around how do we connect our diets to climate change? And as I looked at the landscape of food, um, I've seen the rise of snacking, you know, as, as uh, people are moving into cities, as people um, aren't uh, having three meals the way they used to, that's a, that's, a, that's a solid trend. But another real trend is this, this phenomenon of eco-anxiety, this fear that the climate is changing and people feel powerless to address it. They don't have the information, they don't have the resources, and they don't think they have the ability to do anything about it. And then the last element is the growth of plant-based diets, which is something I've talked about, you know, and certainly we've seen happen. So how do we connect those to, to an opportunity? Well, uh, what if we created nutrient-dense, tasty food that, was, that could inform and empower consumers around the impact those foods have on the climate, and we could make planet-friendly foods accessible and affordable? You know, often there are um, good, wholesome foods there, but they're not marketed well, they're not branded well. And so uh, we are putting together plans to launch a brand called Eat the Change, uh, which will be focused on empowering consumers to give them the options to both lead healthier lives, but health, healthier for themselves and healthier for the planet as well. Now, you asked, Ron, what are some of the challenges? Obviously, given what's happening now, this is not the right time to launch a consumer brand. Every, every retailer in the country is focused on survival, keeping the, stock, the shelves stocked. And so there aren't new products going onto shelves at this time. But of course, that will change. Uh, you know, maybe it's going to be three or four months from now. But right now, we're putting together the plans to launch this brand and expect it to come out, uh, obviously, second half of this year. And yet at the same time, um, while I realize there's an opportunity for this to happen in the future, my wife and I said, well, there is a, an opportunity to do something now right away. And so we have launched a nonprofit effort to connect people's diets to climate change. So it's once again, building on eco-anxiety, the recognition that people lack information and options, and also that there's, people don't have a sense of uh, shared stake in what they can do. So we said, well, let's make sure people have information Let's provide them with the empowerment and let's create a sense of community. And so just this month, we launched something called Eat the Change Impact Grants. And we are uh, launching, uh, we have launched a grants program, uh, which is people are submitting applications now. We, we've already received uh, uh, you know, quite a few applications for nonprofits that are going to be focused on connecting consumers to uh, the fact that their diets have an impact on climate. And we're going to be giving away a million dollars over the next three years to organizations focused on that particular area of impact. And so, um, you know, from our point of view, it, this the the business may wait, but the nonprofit part of it doesn't have to wait. Wow. So those are the ten innovations. I want to just give some closing thoughts, and then hopefully we can open it up for questions. But let me just give you some share some commonalities and some insights. First of all. Listen to the voices around you. You know, for me, think about my innovations that I launched. The kids, you know, Honest Kids came from my kids. Uh, Eat the Change came from my son. Um, and always within that, not just kids, but I'd say consumers as well. Listen to the consumer. Listen to what the consumer says. And in order to do that, you have to be connected to your consumer. But listen also to activists. Think about what they're saying because Anytime an activist is taking a cause up against a company, to me, it actually highlights a market inefficiency. It may not be that, you know, it's funny. I, I look back, um, going back in like 2005, 2006, there were groups like Rainforest Action Network that were lobbying the Coca-Cola company to launch organic and fair trade products. And, you know, I think um, activists will do that sometimes for attention. Uh, and I think, boy, th they didn't succeed. Those calls fell on deaf ears. But I, you could say I was an activist that got the Coca-Cola company to carry organic and fair trade products. And I did it by using a marketplace solution. Uh, but so listen to those types of voices. Mm -hmm. I think another thing that's critical is let your values be your compass and guardrails. So not just about think about where the world is headed, but think about where you would like to see it headed. And so for us, Plant Burger, you know, we've started obviously with one restaurant, but our view is that this becomes a national chain uh, and that plant-based protein becomes accessible, delicious, and widely available. And, and I, I guess I should have given a plug. I'll, I'll do that now. Plant Burger is open for business. Uh, we work with all the major, um, you know, uh, food delivery. So Grubhub, Uber Eats, and, 
uh, DoorDash and all of those are, you know, for delivery of food. Uh, but think about where you would like to see it headed and, and find a way to become, you know, make a cause connected to your business. Another important piece is to make sure you can be a credible ambassador. So I mentioned our family's been vegetarian for 14 years. It was only at the beginning of this year, 2020, that our family decided to go vegan. And I thought, gosh, if, you know, so we, we love the restaurant and, and uh, by no means do we, you know, we don't, and anyone that want to sound judgmental, we certainly at Beyond Meat, we have lots of employees who eat meat and uh, as we do at Plant Burger. But if I'm going to be the champion of this cause, I need to make sure I can look everyone in the eye and say, I, I feel like the decisions I make are consistent with the mindset of what I'm trying to sell. And then the last thing I'll say, and I think this is very relevant for all of the, the leaders on this call, um, you have to protect your most valuable resource. And so what's your most valuable resource? Well, you ask an entrepreneur, they'll often, I think, mistakenly say, well, the most valuable thing I have is my time. It's not quite right, actually. I think the most valuable resource an entrepreneur has is his or her energy. Because you can work 20 hours, but it, it won't all be good, good hours. It's, it's what you bring to your business. And so I think the best way to protect that resource is by making sure you're doing uh, enough self-care. And that's whether that's exercise or being outside or being with your family, whatever it is that makes you whole. And so sometimes it may feel selfish to go for a run or to go for a walk, you know, with a, a family, but it actually is selfless because if you're taking care of yourself, if you're making sure you have that energy to bring to the business, uh, that is what will drive the rest of the team. People take cues from the leader. And if they see a leader walk in and exhausted and, and depressed, that will be the mood and the tone that you set for your organization. If they see you energized, excited about what you're doing, uh, committed to the work and passionate about the work, that will be the mood and the tone. And even as we speak online here, uh, and, and you know, you can, you know, there's this joke that if people are buying lots of shirts and not a lot of pants because they are, you know, they're wearing sneakers or whatever it is. Uh, it's, it, you can still communicate the right energy and the wrong energy. And my, my own little calculation is if I have a choice between you know, an hour of exercise or an hour of sleep, I'm always going to err on the side of exercise because uh, the exercise I get will help make sure I get better sleep. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's, that's a critical piece. And, and I want to encourage you all to make sure you, you're taking care of yourselves during, you know, what is obviously a time where there is stress. Um, and so with that, Ron, um, that's the, those are the slides, but happy to open it up for discussion or questions.